Welcome to this video lecture on state building in the Americas from 1200 to 1450 CE. So within AP World History, we don't really memorize a ton of facts, names, and dates. I mean, don't get me wrong, those things really are important. But that's not really helpful to us. It's not helpful because number one, it's hard to remember all that stuff. And number two, it doesn't really do much for us for the type of critical thinking and argument forming that we really want to do. So what we're going to be doing in these video lectures is setting up big, compelling questions that will help us to look at the core facts, the core details. And this particular one, to get us started, is really important because it's the question about why some societies succeed and some societies fail. And our big theme here is going to be about politics and what's called governance. What did societies do in the Americas that helped them to either succeed or kind of cause them to end up failing? So, to give you a quick example of this, just to demonstrate, the Aztecs were around about the time period, 1200 to 1450 CE, they were a pretty successful society. They lived in an incredibly difficult desert region, yet they ended up with 120,000 people controlling 2 million people in the middle of the Mexican desert. Now I know you're like, okay, that's a lot of numbers, what does that mean? Well, compare that at the time to Paris, that only had 60,000 people, or London, that only had 10,000 people. So in this video lecture, we're gonna look at that question. Why were they successful? Why did other societies fail? Well, I got my coffee, so I'm ready to go, and I hope you have your notes ready. So, let's get going. So we're gonna start off with the Americas. The regions we're looking at include what's called Mesoamerica and the Indian Mountains. Mesoamerica is the region covering what today is really Mexico in the northern part of South America. Now let's just consider that Mesoamerica is a desert region with very few resources. The Andean Mountains are extremely rugged terrain that is really at high altitudes. And, you know, why does this matter? So in order to understand this, we're going to go back in our story for a minute to the Paleolithic Age, which ended about 10,000 years ago. Now the Paleolithic Age, which is known as the Old Stone Age, is when humans were using stones for technology. This changed with the use of metallurgy. So what's metallurgy? Well, that's when humans mix together different minerals to make metals, like bronze and iron. They tended to use these for military defense, building, and, and most importantly to farm. This began what's called the first agricultural revolution. Now we don't know exactly how this happened. It's possible that humans either intentionally decided to start farming or it's that they just kind of came across this accidentally and then started harvesting more grains like wheat, barley, and millet. Actually the latter seems to be more likely. It was probably more of an accident and they just found an advantage in developing this food. Now when they did that they had to settle next to rivers. That meant they had to develop irrigation and as they started to form more food, guess what happened? They had more people. And this led to the creation of villages and then cities. Populations started to grow, and this meant that you needed more organization, like legal codes, security forces, taxes, and political leadership. However, as leaders continued to provide security, records for food production, and favors for the local population, and growth of the population eventually meant they outstripped their resources. And that meant the collapse of communities. Okay, so now that we know what the model is, the beginning, middle, and end, humans settle down, they develop more food, their population grows, the end, they fall apart. So let's see if this always happens. So, one of our first examples is the Mayans. The Mayans were in northern Guatemala. The Mayans formed a group of city-states and kingdoms. They mostly traded with one another. Every once in a while, a group tried to conquer and unite, but this never was really very successful. Now, the big geographical problem in today, what is known as Guatemala, was that the land was swampy. The people ended up there developing what are called bureaucracies or offices. That's where people basically formed up offices and had a job to do, or what we call specialized labor. What they did was these people would drain swamps and create irrigation systems. And this really worked. They formed uh, farm crops like maize, beans, squash, and chili peppers. Okay, this is where you should be asking, how did they do this? Good question. Well, local kingdoms and city-states never united, but the elites were able to organize local people to build these irrigation systems, farm, and then regulate for trade. Okay, so if they were so successful, why did they collapse? 
Good question as well. Well, we don't know for certain, but the likelihood is they overfarmed, deforested their local environment, and caused their own internal collapse. So this fits really well from the model we talked about at the beginning. Okay, let's look at another group. They're out in the southwest of what today we call Northern America. So when we go north to the southwest of today what we call Northern America, what you're going to find out there's a different climate. It's not foresty, it's desert, and there are very few resources. In 1200 CE, we find a group of people at a place called Mesa Verde. There were actually a thousand of them there, and they built what are called cliff cities. Now, when I was in high school, I used to pass over this section in the textbook thinking, why is that important for us today? But just think about this for a minute. How do you organize people in the desert in 1200 CE to build an entire town out of rock? Well, we can gather that their people faced a lack of resources. They also faced really difficult climactic conditions. If they found and farmed items like squash, beans, and maize, their population probably grew. And we do know that their societies were really hierarchical. So how it is most likely that their leaders created projects for the growing population to build a city out of rock that would be defensive against the conditions of weather. Plus, if you look at the construction of cities, there are these places inside of them called kivas, or round circular areas where families would tend to congregate. This is not an accident. They helped to create a community where people would support one another. So how did they collapse? And why are their cliff, cliff dwellings vacant? We don't know for certain, but I bet we can guess, right? Think of our story for a minute. A desert eventually cannot produce enough for a growing population. We do have evidence at the end that there was cannibalism in these communities. This suggests it was most likely a drought or famine, and the government was not able to provide for a growing population. Wow, so we have a lot of collapse, a lot of failure, right? Do we have any stories of success? Well, yeah, we do. Take a look, for example, at the Aztecs. The legendary community that comes out of Mesoamerica was the Aztec Empire. The Aztecs began with a group of people called the Azteca. They were migrants from Northern America. Uh, when they came down in their myths, they found a, or stories, they found a place called Lake Texcoco. There they established an empire that grew to a core, like we said before, of 120,000 people. The Aztecs lived in the desert, so they collected water using huge wooden frames that they called chinampas. The Aztecs created a massive capital at the city of Tenochtitlan, and their central city included massive pyramids, temples, and the famous floating gardens. When you think about it, the eventual demise of the Aztecs really doesn't fit our typical model. How'd they do this? Well, first, the Aztecs had an elaborate political system. Their government resembles ours to some extent. At the most local level, the family unit provided the closest area for organization and stability. Above the family were a group of people called the Kalpoli, or a group of landowners, who would look over and provide for the families. Next up the hierarchy was an executive council for each of the three major cities in the Aztec Empire, Tenochtitlan, Texcoco, and Tlacopan. Each of these executive councils would elect one central leader called the Tlacani. And finally, above the Tlacani was the Huey Tlacani, or emperor. Okay, a lot of stuff, right? Why should you know about this? Well, think about this hierarchy and what they were able to accomplish. Each level of the hierarchy would be able to provide for the needs of the local area. But by having a single emperor, the overall empire could also expand and find new resources. They did this by expanding their military, they would conquer local hunter and gatherer groups, and then they would demand tribute or a regular payment of crops back to these groups. Okay, you might be wondering though, how did they stop these groups since they were conquered from having a revolution? I mean, they were basically conquering far more people than the numbers who lived in the capital of Tenochtitlan. Okay, so enter in the religious system of the Aztecs. The Aztecs were a highly hierarchical society with a priestly class. And the religion of the Aztecs was based upon the farming cycles. This meant that people believed that their society was one of seven different cycles. We tend to think of time like a line, like linear time, beginning, middle, and end. The cycles, though, for the Aztecs resembled the seasons of the harvest. There was birth, fertility, death, harvesting, and receding. Kind of like spring, summer, winter, fall. The same was true for the Earth and the universe. The great sun god, Huitzilopochtli, would fertilize the Earth and keep it going. But this would only happen if the people provided the true fertilizing the Earth, the sacrifice of human blood. This provided a justification for the priests, the temples, and the tributary system 
and the use of human sacrifice. And this type of belief justified the Aztec political authority. Okay, we have another example that's very similar in South America in the Andean Mountains, the Incas. The Incan Empire rose in a very difficult environment given the rugged terrain and high altitudes. The Incas came out of smaller communities called the Mochi, the Shaban, the Waru, and the Tinwinaku. The Inca faced the difficult problem of a lack of arable land, but they would eventually create a massive empire. How? Well, the Incas, like the Aztecs, had a very hierarchical governing structure. Their emperor was given the incentive to conquer. How? Well, no son of an emperor inherited land. The land was eventually seen as property of the Incan society. This forced the emperor to constantly go out and conquer local farming and nomadic groups. However, unlike the Aztecs, the Incas did not demand tribute. Rather, they would assimilate or bring local people in by force. Why didn't the people just rebel? Well, the Incas provided rewards for local assimilation. Conquered people were forced into a system called the Mita, in which they had to help the Incas to build public projects like roads. In return, the Incas guaranteed them food, protection, and shelter. The Indian bureaucracy then centralized food production, and they created a bureaucracy that recorded the food production through what's called quipos, or knotted cords. All this was justified in an elaborate religious system. The sun god Inti demanded that the people produce agriculture and provide sacrifice to continue the cycle of the harvest, similar to the Aztecs. So what do we learn from all this about the Americas when it comes to human development and governance in this period? Because that's our big question, right? Well, here are some takeaways that I would suggest. Number one, humans discovered the benefit of farming and began to develop a food surplus through farming. Number two, populations grow due to food production, leading into the need for a system of governments that are going to use things like irrigation, legal codes, river systems, and security forces to provide for that growing population. Eventually, that growing population tends to outstrip the local resources and it leads to an environmental class. However, notice that there are some societies that escape this narrative. Societies like the Aztecs and the Incas, how do they do it? Well, number one, they created an empire with a governing hierarchy that would look out for the local needs. So you notice that they tended to have a central emperor, but then they also had local leaders as well. Number two, they expanded and found new resources for their populations using a military. Number three, they used a state-sponsored religious system to justify their actions to assimilate people into the system. Okay, so a lot of really complicated stuff, but it makes our conversation really interesting because it demonstrates how people in these early societies organized themselves politically so that they could find a way to provide food for a growing population and eventually succeed against really harsh environments. Thanks a lot. See you in class.